Hi, I'm Peter Prevos, and welcome to the screencast for Chapter 9 of Data Science for Water Utilities. In this chapter, we continue looking at the customer survey data and introduce the basic concepts of linear regression. A linear regression is a statistical model used to find the relationship between two or more variables by fitting a linear equation to the data. And the goal is to find the best fitting line with the least amount of error. Now, this chapter uh, is important because the principles for statistical modeling in the linear model uh, also are carried through in all the other statistical models in the R language. So let's have a go at the code. I've opened the 09 regression.r formula. And as convenience, uh, I went through the global options and the pane layout. And I changed my layout so that the console is on the left and the source code is on the right, so they don't overlap each other. So let's start. The set seed function makes sure that the randomly created variables are always the same. This might sound weird, but when you do statistical modeling, it is sometimes convenient to always use the same set of random data to be able to make analysis reproducible. So we're setting the seed at 10. Adding a little data frame and let's plot this. Let's get started. I am setting the seed of the random number generator. That means that every time I generate random numbers, they will be the same. Now that sounds counterintuitive, but using the same random numbers all the time makes an analysis reproducible. So I'm setting the seed, creating this little data frame here. Um, let's plot it just to have a look. Okay, let's make this canvas a bit bigger. There we go. So some randomly generated points. That if you squint a little bit, you can see sort of a, a linear regression going through there. Now, the way to calculate this line is that there will be two variables. There is the slope of the line and the point where it intersects the y-axis. So that's beta one and beta two. Now, I won't dwell on the formula for this, but I just quickly run through that. Uh, we have beta one and beta zero, and I can now plot that as a line. And it's not a very steep line, but let's uh, set. Try this again, for example, we'll see that we have a totally different line. That's better. Okay. There's a good one. So the point of linear regression is to minimize the distance between the red line and the blue points. In our first example, that distance was very big. In this example, that distance is very small. Now we don't have to remember all these formulas and also um, this analysis doesn't tell us anything other than a visual inspection, how well the model actually fits. Now, what we want to do is look at some data from the customer data. So we'll be running the customer clean script, which was explained in chapter seven. From that now in the environment, we will have the customer data set. But we always only want two variables, which is the contact frequency and the level of hardship. So what that means, how often does a customer contact a water utility? And what is their level of experienced financial hardship? So these people don't contact the water utility very often, and they don't have any hardship. These people are on the phone all the time, and they experience a lot of hardship. So that seems to make sense. Now, the question is, is there actually a relationship between these two variables that is meaningful? In other words, could we predict the level of hardship uh, from the amount of times people contact us, even if they don't talk about the, the topic of hardship? Well, we can quickly inspect this um, data for missing variables. So let's read it first, okay? And this is a visualization. If the visit that package, which was also which was explained in um, chapter seven as well. The black lines means that means there's some missing data. So we'll post those out and only use the 
complete cases. There we go. We have a clean data set. Now we can plot this data set, but it's not very informative because we have an issue that's called overplotting in that there are only seven discrete options for each of these variables. The, they are plotted on top of each other. There are two ways to deal with this. The first way is we can introduce the jitter function. Now the jitter function adds a little bit of random, random these observations. So if I go plot the jitter of the uh, contact and the jitter of the hardship, then the plot looks like this. So we see that they are clustered down the bottom, a little bit of a cluster down the top, and bottom right does not show a lot of data at all, which um, tells us that people who contact a water utility very often don't tend to experience hardship. That's starting to confirm our conclusion, our, our hypothesis. Another way of doing this, and let's use ggplot, is to count the number of times each of these combinations appears. And then we throw that into a plot. And also add a smoothing line so we can see some sort of a linear regression. And here we see that the bigger the bubble, the more often that combination appears. And the trend line shows us that there's a sort of a more reliable relationship at the bottom of the scale, but at the higher end of the scale, there's not a lot of data. So the gray bar becomes wider, which means that the level of uncertainty is higher. For the modeling, the LM function is the linear model function, and it uses a peculiar syntax, which is used in almost all the modeling functions within the R language. The first thing is a formula. So in this case, I'm saying that hardship regresses over contact. So the um, independent variable is on the right side of the tilde, and the dependent variable is uh, the one that we want to predict on the left side of the tilde. And the tilde indicates that relationship. So it's y tilde x, if you want to express it in that way. And then we define the data set where these variables are extracted from. Right. Now we have a linear model with a lot of statistics. And if I run this, you'll see that it gives me the formula that I just used, or the expression that I just used, and the coefficients. So that, that blue line has a uh, intercept at um, 1.365 and uh, a steepness of 0.7. So for every increase in contact frequency, there's a 0.7 increase in financial heart tip. This uh, model is a very specific variable within the R language. We've already seen scalar variables, which are single numbers. Then we had a vector, which is a, a list of a, a row of numbers, if you like. Then we had a two-dimensional situation, which was a, a matrix or a data frame or a tibble. And now we are introducing the list. So if I ask for the structure of this HC model, well, because there's a whole bunch of output here, there's a lot of information within that variable. It's a list that has 12 elements. It has coefficients. It has so all these dollar signs. It has residuals. It has effects, fitted values, ranking, a lot of different things. And we're going to be looking at most of those. For example, if I type H on the HC underscore model dollar sign coefficients, it extracts the coefficients that we saw earlier. So the printing function within R, if it detects a linear model, that function then says, oh, that means you most likely want to see the coefficients. But there's also the coefficients function, COEF, and that's another way to extract those variables. Let's ask for a summary of the HC model. And as you might aware, if I put a vector in the summary, I get some percentiles, but the summary function now detects that this is a linear model and modifies its output to give a comprehensive overview of the complete analysis. So it gives the function call, the distribution of the residuals, and we'll discuss each of those in, in order. The actual coefficients, here are the coefficients, the standard errors, the t-value, and the likelihoods uh, that they are based on coincidence, some significance codes, the residual standard error, degrees of freedom, R squared, and the F statistic. So there's a lot of information packed on this one little screen. 
let's take this apart. The residuals are the difference between the predicted value and the observed value. There are several ways to calculate those. So the first thing we can do is um, we can run a prediction. And the predict function, what it does, if I say predict h model, it puts the formula that was generated by this model into the predict function and then calculates the predicted values for each of the observations. So here are all, all my observations. I can, if I create that as a new variable with the mutate function, then I can calculate my residuals by taking the hardship minus the prediction, so the prediction the one up here. There is also a residuals function. And last but not least, we can also extract it from the HC model um, list. So if I run this, you'll see a little data frame. I'll probably need to make this a bit wider because some of it is dropped off the edge. There we go. We have our predictions. So the actual hardship is five, but it was predicted 2.78. The actual hardship was one, predicted 2.07. It was actual, it was two, predicted 2.07. So that, and then here are the differences between those either manually calculated with the residuals function or extracted from the HC model, and they're all the same. You see in the summary output is the summary of this residuals vector. So the idea is that the residuals should be a standard normal distribution. And this output gives you a quick overview whether that's the case. So the min and the max should be symmetrical over, across the mean, and the mean is zero in this case. So that's roughly the case. The first and the third quartile are roughly um, also symmetrical. Probably the best way to look at this distribution is by quickly doing a, a, a histogram. There we go. It sort of looks like a normal distribution if you squint a little bit. Well, let's do a statistical test. The Shapiro test is available uh, to test the hypothesis that this is not a um, normal distribution and the likelihood of that being the case is close to zero. So for, from, from a statistical point of view, we can say that the residuals form a standard normal distribution, which is a good sign, right? is the residual standard error, which measures how well a regression fits the data. So what is the, the average error that we're seeing here? And there's some steps to calculate it, but obviously we can also extract it from our list. So we count the number of observations. We then count the number of independent variables, which is the length of the coefficients minus one, because there is one dependent variable. Then the sum of the squares of the residuals, it is sum of squares. And the degree of freedoms, so the number of values that are free to vary within this, um, within this set, is in this case n minus k plus 1. And here's my formula. The square root of the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom is 1.6. I can also get that from the model. Remember, if we do summary hc underscore model, we see here that the, uh, where do we go? The residual standard error is 1.623 with 433 degrees of freedom. And 1.63 is, is fairly large because it's, it's uh, 1.6 out of seven. So that's a fairly large error, but let's, so that is a little bit of a minus for this relationship. We have the R squared. Most people just look at the R squared and think that's that's everything. But the R squared in the linear regression is the a statistical measure that represents the proportion of the variance in the independent variable that can be explained uh, by the, sorry, in the dependent variable that can be explained by the independent variable. So how well does this um, equation explain the variance in the data? And that R squared is point Two, three, three, which is not a whole lot. But just because you have a low R squared doesn't mean it's a good regression. And we can also calculate this, um, this value um, using some first principles, but let's not dwell over that now. The F statistics is a statistical test that um, tells us um, how well this uh, this model actually fits. 
and there's a manual way of calculating it and there's also um so it's 131 but what does that mean it then looks at a a f distribution so the f statistics is 131.6 um one and four and 33 degrees of freedom and it's a very low likelihood that that um is where the chance so in other words we can conclude that uh, customers who contact us more for what whatever the topic might be will experience more hardship so that's a useful practical model that remains to be seen but it is here for a principle so all the analytical ways to look at a linear regression we can also do a graphical and if i quickly so i can plot that he model and if i um, divide the screen in two rows and two columns that's on margins I get four different plots and there's a lot of information within here so the first one reviews the residuals uh, versus the fitted values so ideally the red line overlaps with the x-axis which is almost does so that looks pretty good the QQ residuals plot tests whether the distribution of the residuals is a normal distribution which is the case when all the observations are on the diagonal line which is not quite the case but again it sort of snakes around not too bad the scale location plot tests for the assumption of homeoscedicity now which is the case when the red line is horizontal which is not really the case and last one at least the um the leverage plot tests the data for influential observations so which observations are so far from the prediction that so far from the rest of the data so the outliers that they influence um the prediction so we've got three values here 194 316 and 197 they are, they are row numbers and they are have a leverage of 0 0.01 0 0.02 and 0 0.04 so in other words if we remove 197 the coefficient will be increased by 0 0.04 and we can give that a try so you can re we can run this model again and create a new model HE model 2 and we subset we uh, minus 194 minus 197 minus 316 which are the numbers on that on in the graph and then we can do a new summary and we can start comparing the model so these are ways to creating different models and comparing them with each other that's the principle of a linear regression as i mentioned before all the statistical modeling in the r language uses this uh, this same principle one last uh, little case study I want to show you, uh, taking us back to the channel flow example. Now, a linear regression doesn't necessarily mean a straight line. It just means that the um, the A and the B in the equation are linear. So it, it's not a regression of to the power of A, for example, but it's it can be A squared, or in this case, a different formula. Now, remember the kinsvater carter formula talked about the height over the weir and this is all in in chapter two to the power of two divided by three now let's see if we can model this so i'm setting um a seed here because we're doing some random numbers gravitational constants the width of the weir and the the cd which is a factor that is set but let's see if we can calculate that factor. i will create some observations so I have a, a, a H uh, that I calculate the observed values, which is the kinsvater carter formula with some built into it. And let's plot this. So there we go. So let's say I'm actually doing some measurements and I'm measuring the flow as well. And this is what I get. Because in, in nature, you don't get these nice, beautiful curved lines. So here's my little laboratory experiment. Now, the theoretical is the kinsvater carter formula. This is the, our theoretical formula. And I can put that on top of this graph. So this is what I'm expecting in theory. So now, let's do the modeling. So I have my observed values, the dots. The dotted lines here is the theoretical value. So now I'm doing a linear model of the observed values Those are my um, independent variables. And the dependent variable 
is the identity, and I have to do this to force um, the linear model to do a calculation, of h to the power of 2 divided by 3, because that, you see here, is in that formula. The minus 1 means that there is no intercept, because 0 height equals 0 flow. So I can run that flow model, and then put a line on there. Let's make it blue, just to stand out a bit. There we go. It's almost a perfect fit. And let's do a little legend. Now, from that, I can now calculate the coefficient. Because the coefficient of the flow model is 0 0.9. And if I divide that by the rest of the Kinsfada formula, I get 0 0.612, which is pretty close to the 0 0.62 that we theorized. So, so far, this discussion about the linear model. In the next chapter, we're going to continue with some statistical, statistical modeling and doing cluster analysis to do, see if we can define segments within customer data.